I will um, briefly introduce Ashley Rockwell. Um, Ashley is a co worker colleague of mine at Georgia State University. She is the data literacy and learning specialist. And Ashley is going to talk about hackathon hacks, strategies for designing hackathons for students with limited data skills. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you so much, Mandy. Um, I'm really excited to be <laughs> and nervous to be starting off CEDLs this year. Uh, so thank you all for joining me this morning. As Mandy uh, said, I'm going to be talking about hackathon hacks and how um, how we as uh, in the library can kind of help support those uh, either putting them on or helping support them uh, at our at our various um, institutions. So the first thing I want to talk about is what a hackathon actually is. And so oftentimes when people think of a hackathon. If they, if they think of anything at all, they probably imagine a bunch of people in a room like furiously typing on a computer, um, entering in codes, trying to get into, to hack into some system. And that is, can be a form of a hackathon. And um, there are, you know, competitions where hackers try to get into, into certain systems. And those are also called hackathons. But, um, over time, the term hack has really evolved into a new meaning. And I think if the best way to think about it is if you were to define hack as a problem solving, as to like problem solve. So you've probably seen the, you know, the top 10 hacks to make your office a better space. Um, those aren't, you know, writing code. <laughs> those are tips, problem solving solutions. And so it really kind of opens up the definition of what a hackathon is. And that's what's kind of great about hackathons is that they are about thinking outside of the box and trying to figure out interesting solutions to solve problems. And so they've kind of been taken up by more um, public interest and uh, data for good organizations because of that you know, flexibility and um, a typical hackathon is going to have kind of this similar, some similar structure. And so usually it's going to be focused on some type of topic or challenge. And so that can be, um, again, if it's a regular uh, hacking where you're trying to do a bunch of coding, it might be the challenge is to get into a certain system. Or if you're hack doing a hackathon on trying to address, and I'm going to give a couple of examples of other hackathons address a you know, social issue, that will be the challenge. And the key thing um, and part of the portmanteau of hackathon is that it is you know, hacking plus marathon. So you usually have a short time frame um, to get this done and it's often a competition. And so usually you have teams and participants who are given whatever the topic or challenge is, they usually don't know what that's going to be. They may know the topic, but they don't know what the actual challenge is until um, the competition or hackathon starts. And then teams have time to develop their solutions or product proposals, depending on how, how this hackathon is organized. And then finally, those teams um, or participants, because sometimes you can do this as an individual and set of teams, will present their projects. And so in the past, there's been a lot of really interesting hackathons. Uh, this one is one of my, my favorite. I've not participated in it, but I thought it was very a very interesting example. And uh, this hackathon originated in, in the Boston, Cambridge area. There were folks at kind of at MIT who had were having to pump and um, they you know, recently had children and were discussing how much breast pumps suck or do not suck enough. Um, and they got together and formed a hackathon and to try to figure out how can we make the situation better? How can we design better pumps? How can we make places better so people aren't just in you know, the bathroom having to pump? And then they did that in 2014 and they realized that you know, this was great, but that this was more like a really MIT group of people. And this wasn't what a typical, you know, a typical person who needs to pump would look like. And so they planned 
uh, one in uh, 2018, where they got a much more diverse group of folks, both as those who would potentially use the pumps, but also from different fields. So they weren't all just tech engineers. They, you know, they had artists and designers and educators, academics, and definitely like um, really important mo actual moms were there. And so I think that was, this is a really interesting example and it kind of flips the script on your idea of what you think of as a hackathon instead of just people coding you know, having a bunch of a group of people working to, to fix a problem. The organization Data for Data Kind has done um, numerous hackathons. Theirs are called Data Drives, and they usually do a week-long event that anyone can kind of volunteer to participate in, and they pair um, teams with organizations that need some form of data analysis um, help. And so they're very specific in relationship to, to data. They also have more long-term projects, which is great. So one of the downfalls of a hackathon is that, you know, you have this short time and then what do you do afterwards? So um, Data Kind is a great resource if you're looking for, if you're going to do a hackathon and how can you make what you've done, like have lasting impacts. They are a wonderful resource for that. So now I kind of want to talk about what um, we actually did for um, the hackathon at GSU. And so this was a partnership with the Social Action Alliance, which is a, a student organization slash a, a um, credit uh, certificate program uh, housed at the Andrew Young School of Public Policy. And so this, when we were looking at this idea of a hackathon, it, we didn't want it to be just data. We wanted it to be multidisciplinary. We wanted any student, any specifically undergrad to be able to, to participate. And so by doing that, we made sure that the um, proposals that they were going to work on, the end products did not have to be something that involved a lot of coding, a lot of data analysis, or a lot of programming. They didn't have to create some type of tech as a result at the end of it. A lot of hackathons tend to focus on tech. And so we wanted to make something that was more open. Um, so similarly to other hackathons, ours was organized as a three-day hackathon. It'd be wonderful if we could have done longer, but uh, trying to have time for undergraduates to do something during the middle of the semester. This just happened recently, so I'm still kind of processing it all. Um, three days, we had a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday um, timeline. Day one, the students are introduced to our topic that was transportation. And we chose that topic because it's something extremely important in Atlanta. Um, we are a downtown campus. And so our students um, are, you know, some, some of them commute. We have uh, all sorts of really issues related to transportation and mobility. And so that kind of gave us a really broad uh, topic that students could focus on. Uh, we had community partner Q&A at the on that start day so that way students could be introduced to the topic but then also ask um, folks from MARTA who's our public transportation uh, organization <laughs> ask them questions folks from Propel ATL which is a nonprofit focused on pedestrians and bicycle safety and other forms of mobility that our students would get some time to actually hear what are the actual problems of people who are working in these areas are facing. They um, then had a chance to actually create and choose what problems we were going to focus on and create those challenge questions. And um, they were all put into teams and they started to begin their work like that night on their projects. Day two was really focused on a lot more of the teamwork, but the most important part um, from us coming from, from the, also from the library standpoint is this mentors and community partner office hours, which I'll get into a bit more in a second. And so after they've worked on their projects, the day three is the team presentations where they present what their proposals. And so one of the unique things about what we did is that they didn't have to have a final project, they could have a proposal. Because again, we have three days, these you know, are under, undergraduates, it's a very uh, short time crunch. We did not expect them to develop a full-fledged product or a full-fledged a data analysis or um, a full-fledged, because we had creative arts was one of the things, a full-fledged sculpture. <laughs> um, we wanted them to work on proposals. And so the Saturday office hours is really where the library came in um, 
as something that's really strong. So not only because this was something that was actually, I, I got the idea from a, a subject librarian who was hosting the grad student write-in at the library. And we have all these study rooms. And um, her idea was that when people were doing the write-in that they should have different experts, you know, someone from the, the writing studio, someone, people from the library who know how to find books and citations and people from our RDS who are our research data services departments who can help with data analysis. And the students could just pop in. And when we were organizing this, we had so many great community partners who wanted to be involved and they also had tons of data. And that became kind of overwhelming for us on the research data services side, because they're like, oh yeah, we'll share all of this data with you. But that meant that we needed to become familiar with all of their very intricate data sets so we could then share that with the students so they could have access to it. And that added a whole, would add a whole bunch of layers. And so our kind of compromise was we invited those folks who were bringing data sets and then those folks, other folks just wanted to mentor students to hold office hours. And so then instead of students um, having to rely on RDS in order to get access to, you know, how many bus stops and how frequently do people get picked up at certain bus stops and all that kind of information, they could go straight to the people who house that data and ask them questions directly. And again, our students, these are undergrads, they didn't necessarily have data skills already. So much of what they were asking was more of descriptive statistics. And so this was something that was easy for our community partners and mentors to pull up. This was probably the most um, important and so far, besides actually getting to give their presentation um, to people who work on these issues, one of the from feedback from students, this has been the most um, valuable part so far. Um, we haven't, our survey hasn't been finished, but based on what students and also community partners um, who have approached me to talk to me about their experiences during it, this seemed to be the most important because students got to have one-on-ones with uh, people who are doing transportation work in Atlanta. And one of one of my students actually is in, in a class I'm teaching, um, told our other, other, <laughs> other classmates about how great it was that they were actually listened to and respected, even though they were they're like, even though I'm just a first year student, I felt like they were listening to me and they cared about what I was saying. So this part was something, probably my most favorite part and something that I wish and hope that we can do and expand upon more in the future. And so to make sure that students were actually utilizing data, and again, this is limited data, so we wanted to make sure that they use some data, but not, um, we weren't requiring them to do data coding. Part of the proposal and presentation rubric included one that they needed to seek advice during those office hours, because um, we wanted them to actually attend those, and then also show evidence that they either utilize data that they found on their own, um, or they utilize data given to them by our community partners. And so how can libraries support a hackathon? I kind of got into this a little bit. Um, the good news is that I think a lot of what we are already doing or already um, have infrastructure for can be used to support a hackathon. And so uh, if you have ever supported somebody doing a course project, like a team course project, I think a lot of what you would do could be similar. And I also think that we could use like what we've learned from this hackathon to kind of help um, make those team projects potentially uh, more effective or more exciting for the students. If again, like if you can set up office hours with experts for those students to go to during um, their, their classes, I think that that would be um, really great. On the, the right side, these are pictures of students in uh, our newly renovated classroom, uh, which has movable, the, the newly renovation part is that instead of it just having computer stalls, it now has movable chairs and tables. And so this was helpful for students to be able to, we use a space in multiple ways, but for students to either listen to a presentation or start working together in groups. Uh, so LibGuides are obviously a great resource when you're trying to get information to 
to folks. Uh, we use this to kind of keep track of all of our data sets and dashboards and other things that we thought our students would find useful for their project. We also kind of used it as our home base. And so we put our schedule on there. Um, we had the uh, schedules for the office hours, schedules for um, the whole entire event, and then also put our rubrics up there. I think we could have used it a, a bit more as a home base as well. This is our first time ever doing something like this, so we definitely learned a lot. Um, I think in the future, I'd want to include the folks who are doing office hours, some bios, so that way students could kind of get more familiar with them before we actually have office hours. And the, the other huge thing, again, I kind of already referred to it, but is space. And so actually when we're working with um, the partners for this, one of the biggest hurdles they had was finding space. And the fact that the library was able to offer that to them um, with no cost is why they were able to do the hackathon. They would not have been able to afford to do the hackathon and give students prizes and you know, like feed the students during this if it wasn't for the fact that the library is providing this space. So on the left, um, the left-hand side, this is these are pictures from during the first day of the hackathon in our space called Curve, where we have a very large screen. So it's good for kind of giving presentations. But Ashley, also, oh yes. Sorry, you have about, about three minutes or so. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, and so you can see like on this top one, we had, these are our, um, our, our panelists for the Q&A. And uh, what, one of them is very, is an avid cycler and that's why their bicycle is there. But this was a good space for our students. Back in this other, the picture over here, you can, we have more of those study rooms behind and that students were able to use for the office hours or to work with their team. Um, we also have computer stations. We have various you know, tables, tons of places where the, the student teams could actually work and access to technology. Um, we have currently in our library, we have a, uh, a place where you could record podcasts or you could record videos. And so those types of technology resources could be used for a creative arts project for a hackathon. Also, all of our data software being on the computers, on certain computers in the library is also helpful. And so this is kind of a summary of all the ways I think that libraries can support. So using LibGuides, using existing workshops and training and other resources, um, having it in the library physically is really important because you have the technology and potentially space, also passionate people, like having the folks in who did the office hours and being passionate to engage the students was, was really important. Um, I wanna skip ahead. These are some of the things that the students learned that were crucial skills. And then I feel like you could probably guess what you would get out of if you had to, to do a hackathon that's time crunch, teamwork, um, presentation skills, um, but I want to get to more to the ideas for future hackathon and support. Uh, it would be great if we could have had more days because there's just not enough time. So one of the things that we're thinking about is potentially a multi weekend where the weekend before the students go through a training so that they can get more data training and then making um, a more explicit data requirement for the students. So, for example, if they go through a tablet workshop series, making it so that way one of the requirements on the rubrics is that their presentation has to include a data visualization that they've created. Also, Ashley, you have yeah, one minute. One, one minute? minute. Okay, perfect. Um, also, recruiting our subject librarians more. Um, that would have been great because we could have had them in our office hours, especially since this was multidisciplinary. You know, getting our, our arts li subject librarian to, to be able to give our students advice on arts, but also getting more students, um, getting outreach. About half of our students that we recruited ended up being computer science students. The other half were from various majors, from, you know, public policy, social work, to film and philosophy. But it would have been great if we could have had an even more diverse group of students. This took a lot of um, a lot of partnership and a lot of work, and so I want to shout out to my um, our the main host slash 
the, our co-host Tammy Green from the Social Action Alliance, who did a lot of work in getting us sponsorships and partnerships. Um, and also shout out to my department, the Research Data Services Department and the University Library for letting me take on this uh, very complex and new project. Uh, we've learned a lot of things. Um, if you have, I don't know if you have time for questions, but if you do, um, I would love to hear them. All right, thank you so much. Yes, we, we should have a few minutes for questions. So there is one question in the Q&A box. Um, it is, how did you host data sets partners gave you? I understand storage within LibGuides is pretty limited, or were the data sets small enough to just keep in LibGuides? That's a good question. And so that was something that I was nervous about when, um, like Marta, they have so many, so much data on all sorts of things from marketing to writership. And I knew that that was something that we couldn't necessarily house ourselves. And if it, we could, it would take a lot of steps. And so that's why I asked them to, especially since the students didn't need to do complex data analysis and just needed descriptive statistics, that's why I asked them to bring the data with them. So that way they could give the students access um, to it through their own portals. So basically they brought their computers, they were connected to the Wi-Fi, and they were able to pull up that. Some of the data sets were already available online and hosted already by those organizations. And so then on the LibGuides, we just linked to those outside resources. All right, great. We have another question in the QA. Q and A. It is, what do you think the community partners got out of their participation? And was it difficult to recruit community partners? Uh, those are both really good questions. Um, I'll start with the second one first. Um, I think it was, it was kind of difficult to recruit community partners at first because they weren't really familiar, especially because we were doing something new and it being multidisciplinary, that part kind of threw people off, um, explaining to them what, basically we had to kind of pitch them what everything was. And actually we found out and this, that we, you know, we sent out things to the people who said they wanted to be involved, explained the office hour parts. And we had originally only had 14 people sign up to do office hours. On the first day when more people came for the Q&A and to kind of see what was going on, they added on like all of a sudden that night, checked my email and tons more people requested if they could do office hours. And it kind of really took them being there to seeing it for them to uh, understand and then more, more be more likely to want to participate. Um, I know from at least from what folks have told have told me, um, we ha don't have a comp I don't have like a very scientific survey of all of our community partners, but being able to actually talk to the students and is was really rewarding. I think that they got that out of it. Um, in the end, uh, especially Marta, uh, they they had sponsored a prize, a certain prize about the Marta mission, and so if students did their presentation that fit the Marta mission, they could potentially win uh, prize money that was related to it. So a lot of the um, ideas and solutions that the students came up with were related to Marta. And so Marta definitely got a bunch of new ideas. They actually are going to those students in the, in the top um, in two, the top four groups who presented are actually going to be presenting to Marta the entire MARTA organization, they're planning that for later in November. They were so impressed with what the students came up with that they want to see what they can actually implement from this. And so I think they got, I mean, they got a lot. They got a, a lot of ideas. They got to work with students and uh, potentially so have, hire them. <laughs> so we have one more question that we might be able to squeeze in um, is, do the hackathons involve collaboration between multiple departments and how do you all organize it? Organize it. For example, is it led by research data services with feedback from others, or is there an interdepartment group committee? And we need to make it quick if you're okay. going to answer it. <laughs> yes. um, so there was multi-departmental um, involvement. This was our first one. 
I think in the future we would have a committee. It was kind of really just um, Tammy and I, Tammy's from the Andrew Young School and the Social Action Alliance. And so that made that kind of organization really difficult. Now that we've gone through it, I think that we would definitely have a committee um, and do things a bit differently and more, more organized and distribute the work.